Okay, so let's start. Remember, we are playing with abstract surfaces because, as I said, these are not anymore surfaces coming from R3, but with the domain with the given first fundamental form. So hyperbolic models, we were looking at two different models. The disk model, or the Poincaré disk, which is, as a set, the disk, as the name suggests. And first fundamental form given abstractly by uh, 4, 1 minus x squared plus y squared squared dx squared plus dy squared. Okay? The second model was the upper half plane and in this case the, the set is really the upper half plane. But the first fundamental form is abstractly given by dx squared plus dy squared. So the flat metric, in fact, gets used to the notion. I mean, first fundamental form is, um, is the, the word we use when the surface comes from R3. In general, we call it the metric form or the metric, just like that, divided by y squared. OK, we observed yesterday that these two things are actually isometric, even though they look very different, of course. But there is a map, there is a simple map, which is especially simple if you write it in complex, uh, in complex notation, from the disk to the upper half plane, which takes a point of complex coordinate z and gives you i 1 minus z divided 1 plus z. Okay. which has a z inverse, so the inverse is, so phi inverse is the map which takes w and gives you i minus w, i plus w, okay? So this goes the other way around. We check, well, we checked, I told you, there is not really much to check, I mean, you, you compute formally what is dz in terms, you know, formally by chain rule, okay? Oh, sorry, the, 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 the differential of w, the, the relationship between dw and dz, and you substitute and you get that these two forms are actually the same, okay? So, so phi transports one first fundamental form into the other, and so by our general principle, so that means it's an isometry. Good. Now, now, actually today's lecture, I mean, for this part, I'm really indicating you steps that if you want to look in, uh, in books or discuss with me, I'm very happy to do it. But in some sense, I'm just giving you the steps of something and not precise proofs of everything. But um, look now at the upper half plane model, okay, in some force, depend, so this means that these two objects are really the same thing, okay, so depending what you want to know about the geometry of this hyperbolic thing, you may choose this model or this model, okay, so for example, in order to construct, to, to check which are isometries of such a thing, it's more convenient to look or at least I prefer to look at the upper half model. Okay? Of course, everything should have a translation. They are the same, so everything I say in one model should have a correspondent thing in the other model. But the point is, if you look at this set of maps, okay, which are, so now I'm telling you a bridge between this story and complex analysis. Okay? So for, for those of you who like and know more complex analysis, probably you are going to appreciate this part of the story, you look at Möbius transformations. So, how many of you know 
what is a Möbius transformation? Not many, okay? So, Möbius transformations are maps of this type. You take four numbers, four real numbers, A, B, C, D. Okay. With the condition that somehow if you imagine them to put them in a matrix, the, the determinant is, non -Z, is positive, meaning A, D minus B, C positive. Okay. And, you, and you look at the map which takes Z into the point W, and the point W has the form AZ plus B divided by C, CZ plus D. So it's a rational function. Okay. It's, it's the quotient of two polynomials of degree one. Okay. Now, so again, usually called the image point W. The point is that on the upper half plane, these transformations are invertible. And this is the condition, the key condition, okay? And in fact, the inverse, you can write the inverse to be uh, DW minus B minus CW plus A, okay? So this is the inverse, you can check it. You do it twice. I mean, you do first Z to W, and then W to Z, and you should get the identity, okay? The point is that, so these are one-to-one -one maps from U to U, but the, problem, the point is that they are much more than one-to-one -one maps. Of course, they are differentiable, but they are, in fact, isometries, okay? So these are isometries of U as maps from U to U. So how do you check it? Well, exactly as we, as we did virtually here, you play the same game. So you check that if you substitute, you, 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 you write down dw in terms of dz, okay, by formally taking the chain rule, okay? And then what is this form? Remember that this form is what? This is dw, dw bar over the imaginary part of w squared in complex notation. Okay, so then you substitute everything you know, and you check that this stays the same, okay? That this stays dz, dz bar over the imaginary part of z squared, okay? Then there are more. So these are isometries. And then there is more because also the map which takes z into minus z bar, okay? Of course, the map z into z bar does not respect u because the imaginary part, remember u is the, is, you, can you can say that u is the set where the imaginary part of z is positive, okay? So z to z bar is not allowed. You go outside, you, you are making a reflection on the, on the x-axis. But z into minus z bar, it's okay. At least goes from u to u. Okay, and the point is that this is again an, an isometry. Now, of course, iso if you compose isometries, you get another isometry. Okay, because of course, if the requirement is that something goes into, so the first fundamental form stays the same, okay? If you do it, if you compose two maps of this form, you get a map with the same property, okay? So, I can compose one of these with, what, with this map, and I still get an isometry. Now, the point is that these are all the isometries of the upper half plane, okay? So, of course, given an isometry also, the inverse is an isometry, okay? So isometries form a group, okay, by composition. Okay? And this is kind of, these are some, some, the building blocks, okay? So Möbius transformations plus the kind of the conjugate, the conjugation, but with the, with the minus sign, okay? 
Now, of course, you would like to, maybe you are curious to know what are the isometries of D, no? Well, of course, the answer will be take these and compose with phi or phi inverse, okay? So make the transformation in U and then take it back to D, okay? Okay, you can formally write down what they are, okay? Not more complicated, actually, than, than that. Okay, so this is, this is a nice bit of story. It's not easy to prove. It's easy to prove that these are isometries. As I said, it's just a substitution of the differential of these things and check. It's not easy to prove that they are all, okay? In principle, you might say, well, okay, these are isometries, but maybe there, are some, there is something else. This is where complex analysis would work, would, would help you quite a lot. Okay, but now, the, so staying on the upper half model, I would like to, this, to know which are the geodesics of these surfaces, okay? I'll try to keep the models there. Well, so formally, what do we have? We have E, F, and G. So we write down geodesic, the geodesic equations with these functions E, F, and G. Okay? The geodesic equations were written in terms of the first fundamental form right from the beginning. Okay? So what does it happen? Well, you remember the first equation was, a, was an equation like this. So now we look for geodesics in U. Okay, so remember the first equation was uh, dd, we are looking for some curve gamma of s, which was satisfying d, oh actually maybe now if, uh, I, I, I switch notation, these coordinates I will call them u and v, okay, it's okay, as we did in the theory of surfaces in R3, okay. E u prime plus f v prime. This is equal to one half. I'm assuming I'm writing the geodesic equation already parameterized by arc length. So remember this strange function r is not there. Okay, so one half E u u prime squared plus two f u u prime v prime plus g u v prime squared. Okay. So this was the first, and the second was, well, let's write it, d in ds of what? Of f u prime plus g v prime is equal one half e v u prime squared plus two f v u prime v prime plus g v v prime squared. But actually, let's focus for a moment on the first line, okay? So. This is the system we want to solve, okay? But the first line is particularly interesting because, of course, what are the functions E, F, and G in our case? Well, E, well, now written in terms of U and V, E would be the function 1 over V squared, okay? F is equal to 0. There is no dx, dy, okay? And G is equal to the same thing, okay? So in particular, in particular, they do not, none of them depends on u, okay? Which is always a nice accident because that means that in the first equation, the right-hand side disappears, okay? So let me call this one and let me call this two, okay? So the first equation becomes what? So the first equation becomes, uh, well, just d ds of e, which is now 1 over v squared. Okay, so u prime over v squared plus f plus nothing because f is 0. Okay, this is equal to 0. Okay, while the other one in principle looks a bit, will look a bit more complicated, even though f is 0, so at least two terms disappear right away, but then 
f and g, e and g will depend on v. So there will be these two terms on the right. Okay. But this means what? So this means that, in fact, this function here on a geodesic has to be constant. Okay. So in particular, it will be, it will be equal to some c, to some constant c. So I can write it as u prime is equal to c v squared for some c. Okay. Okay. Now. Now remember, this has happened already a few times, we haven't written down the equation for being parameterized by arc length. We have an extra equation here that we are assuming automatically, but we have to write it down. So what does it mean that the, the arc length parameterization? It means that the, the tangent vector is of constantly of norm one. But what is the norm of the tangent vector? Of course, the tangent vector would be u prime v prime. With this first fundamental form, the norm of the tangent vector becomes the equation. What, one equal to what? To x prime squared plus y prime squared, sorry, u prime squared. u prime squared plus v prime squared divided by v squared. OK? So this is the equation for being parameterized by arc length. OK, so now, in fact, observation. So let me call this 3. I leave you to check that 1 plus 3 implies 2. This is a straightforward check. OK, you write down explicitly what 2 looks like, and you prove immediately that if you have 1 and 3, you have 2 automatically. So the second geodesic equation follows from the first and the parameterization by arc length. OK, so we don't have to worry. So really, our system of equation is 1, 3. OK, it's direct. I mean, there is nothing to learn there. It's just a, a three minutes computation. So, so now let's analyze. So the system now is u prime is equal c v squared. And if you want, u prime squared u prime squared plus v prime squared is equal to v squared. So this is really our system. Now let's analyze this system depending on c. For example, case 1, well, case a if you want, case a, c equal to 0. Well, in this case, everything becomes very simple because if c is equal to 0, we are saying that u prime is equal to 0. OK, actually, and then what, what does it mean geometrically? It means that u is constant, OK? OK, so u is constant, but also u prime is, so then becomes here is 0. And so I'm left with this, OK? So then this implies u is equal to a constant. And then, and v is exponential, OK? It's e to the s, plus or minus, OK? But geometrically, whatever the parameterization of v is, even just this condition is telling me geometrically what we are doing. But let me erase the Poincaré disk, which will come back very late, OK? So what's going on? What are these geodesic? After all, we can draw these surfaces. Okay, we just have to keep in mind that the metric is not the metric of the blackboard. Okay, it's something different. It's the metric coming from this strange rule. Okay, but as a set, of course, we are just looking at the upper half plane. And what does it mean that we are taking the curves given by u equal to constant, whatever and v of s uh, some function? Well, OK, this is u. Well, this is uh, u. 
and this is V, okay, because I'm, I'm asking that V is positive, okay. U equal to a constant is just this. Now, of course, it, it also has to come with a special parameterization. You see, it's interesting because it's not, it's not a straight line parameterized as usual, linearly. I mean, usually I would say u, u of s is equal u naught, v of s is equal to some v naught plus uh, s something, okay? I, I finished my name. V, 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 v tilde, okay? V, v tilde, something, okay? I don't know how to call it. W naught, okay? But I don't want to indicate another coordinate. These are numbers, okay? There are two numbers for which this is the usual way we think of a straight line. But this object does not satisfy the geodesic equation. It's not true anymore that this line parameterized in this way is parameterized by arc length. It was true if w naught was equal to 1. You know, it was true in uh, Euclidean geometry, but it's not true now anymore, okay? But still, the trace of the curve, the image of the curve, is always the same. Okay? So geometrically, vertical lines are geodesics. And actually, let's go, let's immediately th throw away a psychological problem. So if you say, well, okay, maybe straight lines. Who cares? Vertical, non-vertical. Are horizontal lines geodesics? Because maybe I say, okay, maybe we are going to end up with the same geodesics of the Euclidean plane. Are what are horizontal lines? Horizontal lines are v equal to a constant. But if v is equal to a constant, let's say v naught, what's going on here? v is equal to a constant, v prime is equal to zero. Uh, is this equation satisfied? No. So here there is a genuine difference between straight lines. Vertical lines are special. Okay. After all, if you think there is nothing to be surprised, I mean, the, the rule of measuring vectors, I mean, the norms of vectors, remembers what is vertical and what is horizontal. It's not symmetric in the rotation. Okay. So, after all, this is not too surprising. Let me erase this and let's see what else we can... Because, of course, this was the trivial case, c equal to zero. What can we say in the non-trivial case? C different from zero. B, case B. Well, if, if C is different from zero, you can manipulate this thing. Now it's up to you to choose your favorite trick, okay, in uh, ordinary differential equations. But I can tell, I mean, this becomes, you can write down dv du, okay, I can extract this information out of this dv du is equal to the square root of, of course I wrote everything in terms of x and y, so now let me not make a mistake, um, v squared minus c squared v4 divided by c squared uh, v to the power 4. Okay. Okay, this is simple out of this. Well, I'm, I'm, again, I, I tell you, I, I try to be honest eh, with you. So when, I, when there is something subtle, I tell you this is subtle. When something is simple, I tell you it's simple. I take, take this u prime from here and put u prime squared here, okay? So that's why you get a v to the power four, you see? But then this is what? This is dv ds. Okay, and you can manipulate it. You can solve formally this equation in this, uh, in this way. But this is the same thing formally. I mean, formally, I mean, you can multiply by du if you want. Of course, this is a, a, a rigorous meeting, uh, me meaning, but I mean, you can take this du on the, on the right and this function on the left, okay, when you separate, try to separate variables, okay. So this implies that dv, in fact, that c, v, dv, divided by the square root of 1 minus c squared v squared, okay, because you see, of course, 
here I have a square. So the square root and then multiply this becomes CV squared, okay? Or the absolute value of C. Now let's not be pedantic, okay? And, uh, okay, so that's why you get uh, this equation. So this is equal to du, okay? But once it's written in this form, I can find the explicit expression of the solutions of these. Because, you see, here I have exactly, I mean, this is d of, if you want, cv squared, okay, up to a half. Okay, so I can integrate explicitly on both sides. And this implies that the solutions are exactly satis satisfy this equation, minus 1 over c square root of 1 minus c squared v squared is equal to u minus a for some, these are, co I mean, a becomes a constant of integration, okay? So there exists a, pot, a number a for which the solution looks like this, okay? Well, well, but this is interest, very interesting, of course, because if I square both sides and manipulate, this becomes what? Solutions to these equations are the same thing as solutions to the equation at u. u minus a squared plus y squared is equal 1 over c squared. 1 plus v squared. OK? So we know exactly geometrically what they are. Again, the, the formal parameterization will be very complicated. You see, I'm solving an equation between u and v, and I'm forgetting how they, do de how they depend on s. As before, when we said they are straight lines, but then the parameterization in s is complicated. Well, in that case, it was just an exponential map, but still, I mean, not a linear parameterization. Here I'm playing formally, I mean, morally the same trick. I'm getting an equation between u and v so that I can draw the picture. But actually, how the, which is the speed? How, how is, which is the parameterization on this? Because this is, of course, it's a circle, OK? Which is the parameterization on this circle? It will not be cos s sin s. Exactly as before. It will be a much more complicated parameterization. Okay? Plus, these are not, this is not any circle. Okay? These are circle because you see, th th there is one thing missing here. There is not a b. There is not a v minus b squared. So what does it mean there is not a b here? It means that the center of this circle lies on the v equal to 0 axis, OK? And that's the only restriction. Then any circle with this property is like this, OK? So that means that geodesics are either vertical lines or the trace of a circle lying with the center lying on the OK, draw whatever you want. These are geodesics of this model, OK? So in some sense, the most efficient way to go from here to here is not the segment, OK? But it's a piece of a circle. Which circle, in fact? So now question. Well, we know that we analyzed all possible cases. But let's see what's, I mean, let's give another I mean, is it true that we have found all possible geodesics? Well, there is a simple way to check, to answer this question. Because by uniqueness theorem, okay, remember that you have the uniqueness theorem in the exi existence, of geode of geode existence and uniqueness of geodesic. It was telling you what? It, it was telling you that if you give me any point and any tangent vector, there exists one and only one geodesic, at least for a short time. OK? Now, is it true that given this point and this vector, there is only one, one and only one of, the of these two curves, one of these two types? OK? Because, of course, if the tangent vector is vertical, there is the vertical line. OK. But if the, if the tangent vector is generic, 
is non-vertical, well, it's simple to argue that actually there exists one of these circles. Okay, how do you construct it? And so on. Okay. You look for the, the only possible circle uh, center on the U axis for which the circle that you draw passes through this point with this tangent vector. Okay? I'm, I'm simply using the property that the tangent vector to the circle is orthogonal to the radius. Okay? So this is the only possibility. And something like this always exists. So these are the all, all possible geodesics because if there was another one, this would contradict the theorem. Okay? What else can we say? Well, of course, a natural question is, well, and if we draw them on the disk, How do they look like? Well, this is again a moment where complex an geo analysis helps, but in any case, I can tell you the final, the final answer. Because basically, you have to take the map phi. Of course, an isometry takes geodesics to geodesics. So the question boils down to what, what are the images of these curves under the map phi, or phi inverse now. I, phi inverse probably, I mean, because phi was going from D to U. So these are in U, you have to take them back, okay? And the answer is this. On the disk, you draw geodesics in this way. So this is your disk. There is no boundary, okay? It's, uh, it's the open disk, it's not the closed disk. And then these geodesics becomes exactly either equators or circles meeting the, the boundary orthogonally. Okay. So these are the geodesic of the Poincaré metric, if you want. Okay. Okay, so now you see why, well, I, I hope I hope you are enjoying yourself because this is a part of, I mean, you are destroying all, all the classical geometry and you are building a new one. Now, for ex either model, pick, pick the one you prefer. It's not difficult to check that they satisfy all axioms of Euclid. All. Remember that actually ax the uh, Euclid's axioms are quite complicated. I mean, there are axioms of uh, incidence. Uh, I mean, the, the list is, okay? In any case, now I, I'm not going to make a piece of history of mathematics, but except the, the famous fifth postulate, which was asking you, is it true that given a line and the point outside, there exists one and only one parallel line passing through this point to the given line? So what's going on here? Well, lines, we translate line into geodesic, geodesics. And now here it's clear that given a line and the point outside, there are infinitely many lines which do not touch, meaning parallel, the original line. Okay? It's clear. So this is the most famous way to, to produce. Uh, the fact that this object exists, uh, you see, which was the problem for mathematicians for thousands of years? That if you, if, you, if you take the contrary or one of the two possible contraries of the postulate, what you have, so because you can substitute with either there does not exist any parallel or there exists more than one, okay? So the fact that, some, that, that, that the model exists tells you automatically that if you substitute it with that it exists more than one, there is no logical contradiction because it exists. I mean, so otherwise you, you think that nature is playing games, okay? It exists. 
So the, the idea of substituting the fifth postulate with its nega negation, the, the contrary in the, mean, in the sense of more than one, huh, cannot produce an absurd, which was what people tried for thousands of years. So substitute, so by, abs by, by, by contradiction, you say, okay, suppose this is not, and then I work and work and work and work, and at the end I want to find a contradiction. Well, it's impossible, because here you have, here, here it is, okay? There is no contradiction, this disk exists, okay? So that, this was really the end of the story of the attempt of proving or disproving the fifth postulate, okay? It's either you consider a postulate or you don't, okay? But it's definitely not a theorem, okay? Very well. Okay, just as a source of, uh, in fact, I didn't even take my notes on this with me, but just to close a little bit this story, you see, there is even a, a stranger accident, if you want. Think of the, now of the local Gauss-Bonnet theorem. Of course, it was proved, it was proved using some geometry of R3, okay? But, in, but it is a statement which depends only on the first fundamental form of things, okay? So it, it has to hold, okay? As long as you know, remember, what is the only delicate part of, the, of what I'm saying is that you, you take a, a, a piecewise smooth curve on a surface, and in principle, you should compute the geodesic equation, the geodesic curvature. Now, to, in order to compute the geodesic curvature, you need to have, in principle, at least for the way we define it, we, we, you need to have it in R3, because you compare the curvature in R3 with its projection on the tangent space, okay? But in any case, if you, assume, if you are taking polygons, you know, piecewise smooth curves, made where the edges are geodesics, this contribution will not be there. Okay, K is equal, KG is equal to zero, and this doesn't come, enter into the picture, okay? But you see here, so basically I'm proposing you to take triangles, geodesic triangles, okay? And try to check what, what's going on, what, which is the sum of the interior angles, okay? Well, here the situation becomes really dramatic, if you want. Because what are the angles? Now, the first problem is that now, if you give me two tangent vectors at a given point, well, you have to be careful. What does it mean? How much is this angle? Because this is what gauss bonnet wants. Well, this angle maybe is not the angle of the blackboard. Because even angles even to compute angles, you need to use the metric, okay? On the other hand, this metric is very special. Okay, so in general, this would be true. It's forbidden to say that these two things are orthogonal. They are orthogonal on the blackboard, but maybe their hyperbolic angle is pi over four. But in just for this specific example, look at the metric. The metric is conformal to the standard one. It's the standard, it's E equal to G, and F is equal to zero. So you know how to compute angles. In fact, conformal maps were born in this way. We proved it, okay? We proved that if you have something which is conformal to another, the angles are the same. The lengths of the vectors are not. But the angles are, unless E equal to G equal to one, okay, which is not our case, but the angles are the same. So that means that actually our pictures are faithful in terms of angles. So we can really compute it by classical Euclidean geometry, okay? So I, now I can draw you a geodesic triangle. How do I do it? Well, I take three geodesics now, of course, Is there a, I, I, I managed to miss a triangle, of course. So let me, uh, one, two. 
and three, more or less. So this would be a geodesic triangle, okay? And you can see, well, guess, how much is the sum of the interior angles? Well, of course, I'm not asking you a number because, but it's definitely much less than pi, okay? And this remembers the fact that the Gauss curvature of this object is negative, is minus one, okay? Because the sum of the interior angle is equal to pi plus the integral of k. k is negative, so it's pi minus something. And you can push this up to an extreme. Because among geodesic triangles, you can imagine stretching, of course, if you draw a reasonable picture, you can put, in some sense, ideally, the vertices in the boundary. So strictly speaking, these are not triangles in, uh, well, look, forget it, okay? Uh, let me not try to be orthogonal, whatever, okay? You can do it. You can push the vertices on the boundary of the disk, but then what happens? Since both are geodesics, they are both orthogonal to the, to the tangent to the circle, okay? So which is the interior angle here? It's zero. So which is the sum of the interior angles? Zero. So kind of surprising, no? You have a triangle whose sum of interior angles is exactly equal to zero. Of course, that means if you, in fact, I didn't do the computation, okay, k, if, maybe I should have told you sooner or later. I mean, formally, again, this is a simple situation of the Gauss, egre, of the Theorema Egregium, okay? Because it's one of those cases where you, your formula for computing the Gauss curvature becomes a bit reasonable, okay? So this implies that k is constantly equal to minus one. Okay, it's a constant negative curvature surface. Again, there is nothing to prove. I mean, you take these functions, you put them in the formula, and you get minus one, okay? So that automatically means that on this, for example, the triangle I drew, the sum is zero, k is equal to minus one, so by gas one formula, the hyperbolic area of this triangle is well, zero is equal to pi minus plus the integral of k. k is equal to minus one, so zero is equal to pi minus the area. So the integral of dA is the area of, the, of your region. Okay? So these triangles, but you can draw many. Okay, which look, may look even quite different, okay? Now, let me, they all have area pi, okay? Okay, it's a very strange geometry. So play the games that you prefer. And uh, let's move on. Let me think if I had something more in mind to say about this. No, I think we are done. Now you will probably appreciate the pictures by this famous painter, Hescher. Okay. Now look on, go on Wikipedia or whatever you, wherever you want, and look for the paintings of this. I showed you one of his paintings, the Möbius strip with the ants, the ants going around the Möbius strip. No? He, he actually, uh, it was quite amazing because 
a few years after mathematicians understood hyperbolic geometry, he actually found many beautiful pictures of... So the problem, basically, if you look at his pictures, you will find games of the form, take one picture and duplicate it with isometries. Okay? Can you cover... So, so this is what you would do in, in, in R2, for example. What does it mean? You take a square, and then with isometries, you put it around every... So whatever, you take your favorite picture, and then you try to start translating it everywhere with an isometry. Translations are isometries, and you can cover R2 with this picture. Okay? Now here, isometries are much more complicated than these Möbius transformations. So what is the effect on one single picture transported everywhere with isometries? And he has built these beautiful paintings. Okay? You, can, you are strongly invited to to see them. Now we change subject. In some sense, what, what, what will start now is really the beginning of another course, because this course was called differential geometry. But really, up to now, we have done, some, we have done classical geometry, trying to build the material to start studying differential geometry. Now, so now I want to give you the definition, the general definition. You are ready. You are mature enough to understand the definition of a differentiable manifold. OK, but actually, this is a great place where to stop for a moment, OK? OK, let's start. So in order to appreciate the definition of a differentiable manifold, let me go back to the definition of a regular surface, OK? So remember, we said S, so regular surfaces, were objects, subsets of R3. OK? So you take a subset of R3 with the following properties. OK, so, uh, so that such that for each P in S, so remember the, the very first picture. For each P, there is an open set. There is a neighbor, I mean, an open subset in R3. So let me draw it as a ball, OK? And I call it V. So there exists a neighbor of P in R3 that I call V, OK? And the map, our chart. And the map, now I call it F alpha, OK? You will see why. Because now I'm really interested in the collection of charts, OK? So not just on, on a single one. From some domain, U alpha into uh, U alpha contained in R2, so a domain of R2, which goes into V, the intersection, with the following properties, OK? Such that. What, what have we asked? Well, first, we asked. It was meaningful to ask that F was a differentiable map, OK? Because after all, this is going from a domain of R2 to, a, to, a sum, to R3, OK? So we know what it means differentiable. So F alpha is, let's say, it's infinity, OK? Then we asked, well, in fact, and homeomorphism, homeomorphism. Okay. Two, we also ask that the differential of the map F alpha at any point, <coughs> so the differential of F alpha at a point Q, so this will go from the tangent space to U alpha at the point Q, which is nothing as it's a copy of R2, because the tangent space to Rn is Rn, okay, canonically. So this goes from this R2 to R3, because the, the target is an R3. So this has to be injective. Okay. OK, so these were the requirements for being a regular surface. Now, 
So F, the, the pair F alpha O alpha, we call it a chart and so on, the image a patch and so on. But now there is an important observation. In fact, let me draw a bigger, a bigger surface. Out of this, con these conditions, we get the following. If we have two charts, so we have one chart F alpha coming from some U alpha, okay? Which covers a piece of our surface. And then we have something else that I call F beta. So another chart, which intersects, actually, if maybe in your picture try to make it clear that there is a nice intersection between these two things, which comes from another domain, which probably have, has absolutely nothing to do with the previous one. Okay. So note that this implies that if you have two charts, F alpha, if, if you have two charts, U alpha, F alpha, and uh, U beta, F beta, such that the image intersect, okay, such that F alpha of U alpha, intersection F beta, U beta, is different from the empty set. Huh? Then what can we do? We can go, we can look at the intersection, and let's call it W. Okay. Look at this, which is an open set. Okay. And we can go, so this W will come from some piece, open piece. So this will be, so this gray area here, this is U alpha, and this gray area is F alpha inverse of W. Okay. But there will be also some F beta inverse of W here. Okay. So I can construct a map from this gray area to this gray area, okay, just by going passing through the surface. Okay. How do well? So I can construct F beta, F beta to the minus one composed F alpha. This goes from where to where? I'm looking at it as a map from F alpha inverse of W, so this gray area, into F beta of W. And I can play the opposite game, of course. I can go from here to here just by switching alpha and beta. So I have alpha. I have F alpha minus 1. F alpha minus 1 composed F beta. Let me just double check that I haven't switched the domain. And, no, no, but it's okay. It's, it's okay like this. So this goes from F beta to the minus 1 of W into F alpha of W. Okay. I have these two maps, which are, of course, one the inverse of the other. Okay. If you put them together. No? It's always the composition of something which is with its inverse. So, but the point is that these maps now are defined on domains of R2. They go from one domain of R2 into another domain of R2, and so on. Okay. So, in particular, I know that these are smooth. If you want, are one to one and smooth. Here, yes, no. F minus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. 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 No, I want. In fact, I want to end up here, not here. Okay. So these are smooth. Okay. This was a key property in our study. Okay? We used this property infinitely many times, right at the beginning, actually. Okay? Because, for example, this was the point where we understood it was possible to define what, what was a differentiable function on a surface. Remember? 
because this was, it, it is thanks to this that it's possible to say I, I call a function defined on S differentiable if when I restrict it to a chart I get a differentiable function. Well, who is going to tell me that this definition does not depend on the chart? Exactly this property. If I take two different charts, the difference between the two functions that I write is a diffeomorphism. Okay? So differentiable in one chart is the same as differentiable in the other chart. Okay? So this was kind of a key. You see, it's so basic that it's kind of fundamental. Okay? What are differentiable functions? Okay. Now, the problem is that we, these, were, these properties were true because they were following from this. But here, I really needed R3 because it's this key property. Okay. How can, if I want to speak about manifolds, I don't want to have a subset of anything. My manifold is a set as it is. And I want to perform the same things we did on regular surfaces on this set, completely forgetting that it, it is a subset of R3. Okay, so how can I do it? Well, the idea is exactly to take this key property and put it as a definition. Okay, so let's see how it looks now, the formal definition. In fact, there is no reason to restrict ourselves to dimension two. Okay, so let's give the general definition in any dimension. So definition, an n, n dimensional differentiable manifold is a set, and not a subset is a set M with a family of injective maps. So I put it right at the beginning, the fact that what are going to be the charts have to be injective maps that I call F alpha, which will be defined on some U alpha Sub, uh, domains of our n, okay? There is no reason to restrict to n equal to 2, so into m, u alpha open, such that. So now what do I require? You see, the point is that I cannot say anything about something like differentiable, no? Because I don't know what it means. So how can I reconstruct it? Well, First, I certainly want that around every point there is a chart. So this is easy because that's like asking that the union over alpha of the images of F alpha U alpha, this is the whole set. So this automatically implies that at every, for every point there is at least one of these things which cover, which cover this point. This point. But then everything else must be contained in the, in the other condition that for any pair, for any alpha and beta, such that f alpha of u alpha intersect f alpha f beta of u beta is different from the empty set. So every time two of these maps intersect in their image, And in fact, let me give, in fact, give, give, give this set a name. Okay, this is W different from the empty set. Okay. Then I want that the, then the inverse image of these, F alpha to the minus one of W and F beta, F beta to the minus one of W are open sets. in Rn, because that's where they live, okay. and F beta to the minus 1 composed F alpha, and 
f beta f alpha to the minus 1 composed f beta are differentiable. Okay. One little care. Uh, this, this type of condition did not appear before because it was automatic. Because we were looking at the regular surface as a topological space with a topology induced by R3. But now, notice that M is just a set. So, I don't know what is, it, what is an open set on M. Okay? So, I have to declare... I mean, this is a property on the maps F. F takes at least these intersections. These intersections must go back to open sets of Rn. So that's where I know what I'm talking about. Okay? And then actually there is a technical third condition, which is to require that the, this, is, this will be called an atlas, so the sets the, the family of sets U alpha and F alpha is called an atlas. So the atlas U alpha F alpha is maximal. Is maximal with respect, so relative to 1 and 2. Okay, this is, this is just a technical thing, just to avoid uh, logic uh, problems in proofs. What does it mean that this set is, max this atlas is maximal? Is that if you find another set, V, G, a set in the map, which satisfy, if you put it together with, the, with U alpha, F alpha, it still satisfies property, well, of course, if you add something, if, if your initial thing was satisfying one, it still satisfies one, okay? But if it satisfies two, which is not automatic, so if you have this new chart, which still satisfies these properties, then you have to add it. So you are looking at the same time, in one shot, you are looking at the whole set of charts, of all possible charts, okay? So for example, remember this, because this is, will be automatically a huge thing. So, for example, if your thing was a sphere in R3, you are not saying, I'm taking the two charts, for example, given by stereographic projections. No, this is absolutely not maximal. Because, for example, the charts coming from the, all the other proofs that we gave are not in this atlas, so you have to add them. But then you have to add also a small disk. You have to add it, and so on. Okay, so it will be a, a, an incredibly big number in fact, not even a number, okay? It will be more than countable, for sure, okay? Well, of course, we use the same... Le okay, now it's over. One, two, and three. Uh, the point is that you can always achieve it, okay? So once you, once you get on a set a family of charts, F alpha, U alpha, which satisfy one and two, then you say, okay, and now you maximize it. And I don't even have to know what, what, what are you really doing when you do this operation. Okay, there will be a maximal atlas with the properties one and two. Okay, so you don't, you don't really care. So, because I remember my, my, my psychology when I was a student that I thought this was a disaster. No, this is in fact absolutely nothing. Okay, you put it just to avoid logic problems and then you forget it. Okay, it will always be the maximal thing. But... In, in practice, you, it, it's, like, it's like it's not there. Okay, we use the same words for these objects, in the sense that, as we did for surfaces, in the sense that the, the pairs U alpha, F alpha, we call them charts or local parameterizations or, okay, we use exactly the same, the same words. <clears throat> so why... In which sense this, I mean, you see that this is very different. I mean, it's inspired by the definition of a surface, but it's very different. In which sense? Well, as I said, probably, in fact, this is one of, the fact that this is just a set, okay? So, observation. In fact, if you have a set with something which, which satisfies these properties, 
So a differentiable manifold. In fact, you have a topological space. But now it's not given before. It's given after. So what is called the differentiable structure, this object here, this family of things, is called the differentiable structure of the manifold, induces a topology. Okay? How? So the differentiable structure, u alpha f alpha, so I write it for the first and last time. This collection is called the differentiable structure of M induces canonically a topology on M. How? Well, I can just say, take the topology for which f alpha u alpha is a basis. You see, which sets am I looking at? So you, you keep in mind this picture, but you, cannot, you know that you are doing a mistake, OK? So which are the open sets on M? Well, because in the picture, they are the ones coming from R3. Now, there is no, R, no R3 around my set. So, but what, it, what was true? Somehow, the basis of the topology was the image of the charts. OK, do it. Okay. Define the topology to say, say that the image of the charts are a basis of, a, of, of this topology. Okay. They satisfy the axioms of a basis. Okay. This is like saying, in other words, you can say it in this way. A, I have to declare which is an open set. OK, I say that A is open if every time it intersects a chart, if I look at f alpha inverse of A intersection f alpha of u alpha, no? so, so basically I'm saying now, is this open? Well, this is open if for all possible charts which touch it, because otherwise it's empty, okay? otherwise I'm looking at the empty set, the intersection, if I take the intersection and then I take it back, I get an open set here. Because here, of course, I have the Euclidean topology. Okay. So if this is open, is open in Rn for any alpha. Okay. That's a, an equivalent way to say it. But this observation should go on at least 30 seconds. Because unfortunately, out of this definition, you cannot get essentially any nice property of this topology. Okay? In part, I mean, in a reasonable world, you would like to work with nice topological spaces. For example, Hausdorff. For example, second, verifying the second axiom of numerability. Okay? Second numerable, or how you want to say it. Okay? <coughs> Countable basis. Okay? Now, this topology does not verify, in general, any of these. In general, it is not Hausdorff. In general, it not, uh, uh, does not have a countable basis. Okay? So we add it because, I mean, it's uh, the least restriction we want to put okay, on the type of objects. Okay? So from now on, we assume that this topology which is called the induced topology, of course. It's induced by the differentiable structure. So that, that this topology is Hausdorff and has countable basis. So, OK. Of course, the other simple observation to make, after all, we have built this definition out of the definition of a surface. We have taken a property and we have made it into an axiom. So clearly, regular surfaces are two-dimensional differentiable manifolds. Okay? 
regular surfaces in R3 are examples. Okay. Now, so in the last minutes of this lecture, let's, pr let's produce at least one other example. just to appreciate the fact that we are starting doing something more general than before, even in the two-dimensional case. Actually, this works in any dimension, but it's not just that. Even in two dimensions, we are studying a larger classes of objects. Larger class of objects. OK. So example. Projective, projective plane. Okay, so I restrict myself again to dimension two, even though it's easier. Over the reals, I mean, so what we call P2R. Okay. So as a set, what is P2R? I'm sure, to, I'm sure you have met it many times. So strictly speaking, as a set, we can say it in many different ways. As a set, this is the set of lines through the origin in R3. Okay, so PNR is the set of lines passing through the origin in Rn plus 1. OK? So this is the set of lines, the set of lines passing through the origin in R3. Well, how can we describe it? This is a kind of a nice geometric sentence, but let's have a, a more analytic description. description. Well, one way to say is that P2R is, in fact, R3 minus the origin quotient by an equivalence relationship. So which equivalence relationship is that for any line, I take one representative, meaning two vectors, x, y, z, should be identified with any multiple on the same line. OK, with any parallel vector. So it's lambda x, lambda y, lambda z, with some lambda different from 0. OK, otherwise, well, first, otherwise you are not inside. But this is, I mean, you can say, OK, let's add the origin, but then it doesn't become an equivalence relationship. OK? Very well. And it's usual to indicate the equivalence class of a point in R3 by x, y, z, or sometimes with double dots, as you prefer. Okay, just as far as I'm concerned, I'm happy with square brackets. Okay. Well, now I want to convince you that this is actually a differentiable manifold. Well, in principle, I could tell you, well, this is probably, it's an example you met, well, the first time in algebra, the second time in, in points at topology, because it's probably one of the simplest non-trivial cases where you have to study the quotient topology. No? I mean, because in some, this is a topological space, and this is in, this in, the, the Euclidean topology induces a topology on this object here. So it's a classical exercise in topology. But this is, this is going in another direction, because this would give me already a topology, okay, while the differentiable structure doesn't need it. So, Let's see, even without all those considerations, how to build a differentiable structure on this set. So let's look at it just as a set. Well, define three. There are, of course, three, three very special sets here, which cover everything. So define V1 to be the set of points x, y, z in P2R, such that, you see, in the projective space, it's completely meaningless to say such that y is equal to 5. Because it's not well defined up to the equivalence relationship. Because you multiply by 100, and then y becomes 500. Okay? The only meaningful value of the coordinates, if you want to call these coordinates, is 0, non 0. Okay? After it's non 0, you might as well say 1. There is one representative which has that coordinate equal to 1. OK? So, so this is just to justify. OK, so for example, the first one is the set of points for which the first coordinate is non-zero. But remember, it's completely meaningless to say what it is. 
Once it's non zero, it's anything. Okay. Then V2 is the set of points, of course, now you can easily guess, such that Y is non zero. Okay. And Z and V3 is again the same thing, such that Z is non zero. Okay. Now, of course, these three sets cover P2, because 0, 0, 0 is not allowed. Okay? So they cover as sets. So the union of V1, V2, and V3 give the whole set. But now on this, so we are in good shape, but we have to construct the maps, the parameterization, the charts. So how do I construct the charts? On these, so with obvious notation, uh, fi will be defined on vi, okay? In fact, it's defined, no, it's, it takes values in vi, okay? So i will be one, two, or three, okay? Define how? Well, I take two numbers. That's exactly the observation I did before. Once you know that, for example, the first coordinate is non-zero, there is one representative of this point which has the first coordinate equal to one, okay? So I can take two, so the, the only two freedom, the, the, the two degree of freedoms are here, at y and z. Okay, so u, v will go to, well actually this was not such a great idea, so f1, so let's write it in this way, f1 goes in u, one u, v, f2 goes in u, one, v, and U F3 goes in uh, U, V1, okay? Otherwise, you have to invent a notation to say where to put the U, the 1, okay? So the 1 goes in the ith place, okay? So now the claim is that these things satisfy the properties of a differentiable structure. So the maps, uh, the maps, uh, so the charts, U, uh, VI, FI, put, all, putting all this together, is a differentiable structure. Of course, here I'm already making the mistake I mentioned to you before, up to point 0.3, okay, up to maximality. So they satisfy one and two, and then there will be a differentiable structure by adding everything else, okay? But let me do it, a differentiable, is a differentiable structure. Let's say up to three, okay? Which is armless, okay? Well, point one uh, we already observed. So one is okay. We have to prove properties one and two. One was just the fact that they cover. Well, every point in P2R has one of coordinate which is non-zero. So it lies in one of these images, okay? Let's go to the second property. The second property means take two charts for which the image, remember the picture, even though Remember that you, you don't have to think of this as a subset of R3, okay? So here you have a W, here you have a gray thing here, here you have a gray thing here. This is F1, F2, for example, over F2, F3, whatever, F alpha, F beta. And now you go from here to here by composition of the inverse, okay? And the question is, is this map differentiable? Is injective? Is uh, everything, okay? Is, it's a, is it, it is an injective, uh, well, in fact, it, is it a diffeomorphism? Okay. We have a word, let's use it, okay? Well, I hope you agree there is no problem, no harm, no loss of generality, assuming that we do it for F1 and F2, okay? Uh, just to simplify, so fix i is equal to, or if you want, in the, in the definition they were called alpha and beta. So alpha is equal to 1 and beta is equal to 2, okay? Otherwise, everything is the same. <coughs> so, what do we have to do? We have to check what is f1, f1 to the minus 1 composed f2, of V1 intersect V2, okay? And the problem is, 
is this an open set? And then is the map between this and its homologous on the other side differentiable? Well, well, the point is, what are these points? Well, if, if a point stays in V1, has the first coordinate non-zero. If the point stays in V2, has the second coordinate non-zero. Okay? So we can say that these, the points lying here, in fact, where, where do they stay? Um, they have to stay where? In R2. So these are points of R2. So which U and V stay here? Well, as I said, this set is the set of points such that x different from 0 and y is different from 0. Okay. But that means, that means that this set is the set of u, v such that u is different from 0. Okay. The other one is automatic because you are taking it to into the right image, OK? So, so I, uh, sorry, I wrote a mistake. Um, I'm taking the inverse image of this set via F1, OK? So the point is whether the inverse image of this set uh, here is open. This is the first question, OK? Then we have a map where I will put and F2, okay? But the first problem is, is this gray area open? Well, it is, okay? This is an open set. And of course, if I did it with F2, I would have gotten V different from zero and so on, okay? So this is automatic. Now, the problem is, what is what I wrote before by mistake? So F2 inverse composed F1 of a point u v, okay? Because now I'm taking a point here. Now I know what it means to lie here, okay? And now I, I want to go here. So I take this point, I do f1, and then I take f2 inverse, and I go here, okay? Well, let's do it step by step. It's written here what is f1. So this is f2 inverse of what? Of the point with projective coordinates, 1 uv. Okay. And how do I get f2 inverse? Well, remember that I know that u is different from 0. Okay. Because this point must lie here. Okay. Now, how do I do f2 inverse? Well, in order to do f2 inverse, f2 is this map. But this point is not like this. So in order to say from which x and y it comes, uh, I need to put this point in this position. And then I will look at the first and third coordinate. How do I do it? In the same equivalence class, there is, of course, so this is, if you want, f2 inverse. Now I'm writing a tautology because I'm really writing the same point. Okay? This, this point here is exactly 1 over u, 1, 1 over v, 1 over, sorry, v over u. OK, now that I've put the representative of this equivalence class in the, stand, in the position I like, I know that F2 inverse is the first and the third. So this is 1 over u, v over u. OK. So this map takes the R2 minus u equal to 0 into this, this the image, whatever it is. And it's given by these functions. So, and this is clearly smooth. Okay. We are away from the locus where u is equal to 0. Okay. Actually, I should have also argued, but it was so, I forgot, I mean, First, I should check that fi are bijective, no? Or, I mean, at least injective, no? I mean, but this was completely trivial. I thought there was a question. Why u is different from 0? Why u is different from 0? Because I start not from the whole 
not from any point of R2, but only from the gray area. So the first thing I observed is what is the gray area. The gray area is u different from 0. OK? So. OK, let's repeat it. For, let's repeat it. First, where should I look at this? Where, wh which is the right domain to ask the question? The right domain is, uh, unfortunately, the general definition disappeared. But it's f1 inverse of w. So I'm looking at this map from where to where? From the inverse image of w, which goes into the inverse image via f1, which goes into the inverse image via f2. OK? So the first problem is characterize the domain. And the characterization is here, because the inverse image, this is w. So the inverse image of w is the set of points where u is different from 0. So then I know that the inverse image of f1, sorry, that the image of f1, uh, this is independent of where, is just the point 1v, 1uv. But now I know that u is different from 0. So in order to write down the inverse image, I need to put a 1 in the second place. So I do it. How do I do it? I divide by lambda, OK? What is the equivalent point? I have to divide, to multiply by the same factor or coordinates. In this case, lambda is equal 1 over u, OK? Which is not 0. So 1 over u, 1 v over u. Now it's done, because once I know that this is a 1, the inverse image is just the other two coordinates. OK? This was the argument. OK, so let's stop. But just to, just to finish, OK. So this defines a differentiable structure. And you are strongly invited to think of whether this is, so this defines also a topology. Now, now you can, there are many exercises you can play with. Because, for example, now, by general principle, this differentiable structure induces a topology. Is the topology the old one that we knew from the topology class? Yes. It's the quotient topology of the Euclidean topology. OK? Almost by definition. If you think what you have to prove, you, you stop because you realize that there is nothing to prove. OK? Then, what else can you ask? Much more subtle question. Is this a regular surface in R3? This is difficult. OK? This is difficult. This is a difficult question. Try to see whether you can come up with uh, some idea. Well, of course, if the problem was just to have something new, I could have put here n plus 1 and defined PNR. I have n, n plus 1 coordinates. I have n plus 1 maps, n plus 1 open sets. Same proof. Everything is the same. Here, n equal to 2 was completely irrelevant. OK? So this is, in any dimension, you have this example. OK? The third condition, yes. Mm -hmm. You, you make it maximum. You say, well, you need to observe that once you have something which satisfies 1 and 2, there is only a unique one, maxima, which contains it. So you keep on adding stuff, but you don't, you don't need it. Okay. 